of you in the comfortable chairs, if there's any snoring or snoozing, I'll be sure to point you out. So just a, <laughs> Gary Mavera, just an advance warning on that. Welcome to this uh, wonderful discussion on monetizing content. For those of you I don't know, my name is Valerie Creighton. I have the privilege of serving as the president and CEO at the Canada Media Fund. With uh, We are funded by the Government of Canada. Helen Kennedy is here, our great representative. Helen, quit taking notes and take a round of applause. And two of our, two I think, I don't think there are more of our BDU funders, Rogers and Quebec or Serge and Pam are here with us as well. So we have some great people here. Uh, we had a wonderful advance call on this. We we're thinking we might be burnt out, but <laughs> we're going to try not to be for your benefit. So with us today are, to my left, Chris Pavlovsky, who's the CEO of Rumble.com. A friend at Chanella, who most of you know, who I've got to get her new title right, Director of National Promotions and Communications, Telefilm Canada. It's almost as hard as discoverability. And Jocelyn Hamilton, of course, president of E1 Canada, E1 Television in Canada. So welcome. Um, just a couple of thoughts as we discussed on the panel. I thought I'd just give a couple of sentences to set the stage for our debate. So as you all know, in the last 50 years or so in this country, we've developed an ecosystem that's primarily focused on the development and production of great content. <laughs> the regulatory environment required broadcasting or distribution of this content to be aired often with at a time and in a, in a defined time frame or screened in major centers. And then everyone was on to the next project. Generally speaking, our historical behavior has had less focus on aggressive marketing, monetizing, branding, and discoverability, certainly, of Canadian content in the global marketplace. However, that certainly has been changing. Our regulated system has served us well, and our content is increasingly celebrated, recognized, and sold all over the world. Come on in. Take the comfortable chairs. Just don't fall asleep. I'm, everybody OK? Yeah, there's lots of room up there. But the world, too, around us has changed. The digital revolution has opened up unprecedented opportunities for content everywhere, and OTT appears to be with us to stay. Choice is unlimited in this tsunami of available content. So where and how will Canada be found? Advertising as the dominant revenue has been seriously challenged, both in traditional TV and digital channels. The limitations of the advertising model have forced industry players to rely on several models of monetization strategies simultaneously. User-generated content through social platforms and OTTs have circumvented these established models. This has resulted, of course, in more exploration and still greater fragmentation. In the digital economy, the dive use concept of free access prevails. Having access to a product is gradually replacing the appeal of ownership. This, however, doesn't necessarily help pay for capital-intensive premium content. So, how can the creation of high-quality content that's exportable and discoverable be supported and, more importantly, monetized in this increasingly global marketplace? So these really smart, experienced people are going to answer that question for us today. <laughs> right? You're going to solve it all. <laughs> You're going to solve it all. So, Chris, I'm going to start with you. So just give us your views on... Rumble itself and the new opportunities that a service like yours, a site like yours, can provide for content discoverability and new producers. So currently, the uh, the option for a social video creator or a user generated creator, however you like to look at it, is to go to YouTube, uh, upload your content, or go to another platform like Vine, Instagram, and hope for the best. Um, with uh, Rumble, what we're doing for content creators. Uh, is in addition to helping them monetize, but uh, we're, we're giving them the opportunity to reach uh, not just one single platform, but get to platforms they normally can't get to. So like your, your Yahoo's, your MSN's, your AOL's, of course, Rumble, and uh, YouTube, and uh, all the other platforms from Facebook to Instagram, etc. So on a single central platform, we're helping creators, social video creators for the most part, uh, get to all these different places and intelligently get to the right places so they can maximize their distribution and their discoverability onto these uh, into the right platforms rather than just putting it into a general audience and hoping that someone's going to stumble upon it on YouTube through a search and then hopefully an editorial team at Yahoo is going to pick it up and uh, you know if that's all, all luck why not just take that video to the right place at the right time 
And that's what Rumble's doing for content creators in terms of helping their discoverability. Want to talk a little bit about what's happened? What's your success around that? Yeah. Um, so we started uh, about two and a half years ago, October 2013. And uh, in the last six months, we've uh, you know really kind of made a lot of noise. Recently, we were just, uh, according to Comscore, we're now 41 in the U.S. for uh, you know video views uh, ahead of uh, the likes of Amazon, Ellen, uh, BuzzFeed, uh, which is pretty significant uh, in the U.S. market. So we're really helping creators in terms of getting their distribution and obviously monetizing it as, as the best we possibly can. Okay, so Jocelyn. E1's got a big footprint, lots of content, great success all over the world. How does this whole question of digitization play into that, or does it? And what are your thoughts around what's happening around us with our premium content and the new world that Chris just described? Well, I was just going to say, in, in relation to what you're talking about, you know, there are, there's an array of different content um, from the creator-driven, social media-type content to the high-end HBO content. There's no reason why it, it all can't live together. And so I always worry, and I guess I don't want us to lose sight of this, the buzzy uh, aspect of uh, the digital world, and I'll quote-unquote that because I'll talk about that in a second, um, that we all kind of do some sort of paradigm shift over there when forgetting that, let's not forget that this industry that we have built for over 30 years is now just getting their legs. We are in 100 plus countries around the world. Our kids' content is all over the world on every single US network. Um, we have built it and propped it up so that it is internationally viable. So we are now being seen as a, as a great country uh, that has built up its content. And you don't want to lose sight of that just because we think that uh, there's a, you know, an individual uh, or that can also be making content. And so uh, I often kind of say, so Lily Singh is everywhere right now. You've seen her on the buses. She's got a big promotion going on. You know, the only people making money off of that is Lily Singh and YouTube, which is not a Canadian company. And so that's fantastic for Lily Singh. I think that should exist. But that, that in itself does not an industry make. And we employ, you know, over 600,000 people in this country. And we have a big industry that is uh, um, doing, you know, from unscripted reality content all the way to high-end content. And, and delivering all around the world. I mean, I think something we talk about a lot is that people don't know even, the consumers don't know what Canadian content actually exists. You know, people don't know that Saving Hope is Canadian and doing 1.3 million in ratings every week. People don't know that, uh, some people don't know that Orphan Black is Canadian. People don't know Love It or Listed and Property Brothers are Canadian. People, it's shocking sometimes, right? And so there is a misnomer sometimes about what it is. But we have to not lose sight of the bigger aspect of the ecosystem. And certainly a company like E1 distributes all over the world, um, you know, and, and 100 plus countries for a Ricky Blue, for Saving Hope. You've got Book of Negroes, which is winning awards all over the world. And Orphan Black, I can speak of other companies. Orphan Black, I mean, what these shows do is it changes the perception of what kind of content is coming out of Canada, and I'll say powered by Canada. And our system has allowed us to compete at that level and allowed us to compete. And we just need to continue to be able to compete at that level because now everyone who's been enviable of our system is now has you know perked up and started to uh, uh, copy it. So now you look at some of the states that have brought in tax credits that are now in the same vein as ours. You can see uh, what some of the other countries around the world have tried to do to uh, sort of copy our system. And now we're competing in that playing field. We no longer, you know, and so the competition is very high and we need to continue to allow ourselves to be up at that level, to compete at that level. So that when people say there's 400 scripted series, um, out there right now and there's an abundance, we need to be in those 400 series because very easily we could not. So very easily you could not is the key there. Right. So talk a little bit about the could not. Like when anyone is looking at their content, developing it, taking it around the world, do you have a specific strategy that goes beyond the traditional broadcast sale to country? Do you have a strategy that would encompass 
uh, the digital piece, the online piece, the marketing even of that content in that way? Or is it still really distinct in the process that you think about when you're looking at a scripted series? We certainly, you know, look, the Canadian broadcasters have been, are extremely supportive, but, but at all times, even early, early on, we, I mean, and you have to go back and make sure that we're protecting the creation, the fostering the, the, uh, of the development process of making sure that content is, is being created before it can actually be accessed somewhere sometime on a platform, right? So that's that's part of the whole process that we can't lose sight of. But we all we have you know offices in LA, we have offices in London and Australia, and so the you know the walls are coming down. It is definitely a global world, but it stems here in Canada. We're proud that it stems here in Canada, but we're always looking at okay, well, what's the rest of the world looking for? You know, you know we're ta we talk about that at every. The rest of the world is looking for procedurals, but the U.S. is not right now. The U.S. is looking for serialized. The rest of the world is you know, kind of may maybe there's an overabundance of it. So we need to have a, a, we have a portfolio of different development to ensure that we're keeping a global eye on what the rest of the world wants, knowing that Canada has a big piece and a big play at the early stages. And, you know, the broadcasters are, are, are understanding of that too. And they're looking at, well, what do you think would work? Sometimes, it, and that's where, as we talk through this process of, and Melanie Jolie coming out with, you know, the, the everything's on the table. Well, that's where we've really got to talk about, you know, flexibility, opening up our, the ability for us to package things in a way that will sell around the world, but it's powered by Canada. Do you know what I mean? So what does that, what do I mean by that? Right now, you can't get tax credits by being on an OTT. You just said, OTTs are not going away, we all know it exists, yet you can't get a tax credit if you had a commission show on Show Me or Crave or Netflix, no tax credits. So, you know, we kind of need to open up the, that discussion because those are platforms that exist and yet it's fully 10 out of 10 Canadian or eight out of 10 Canadian and you can't get tax credits. So just things like that need to be in the discussion for us to have the propped up positioning of a Canadian show but with a global view uh, from a content perspective. Okay, before we go to the boxing arena of regulated, non-regulated, <laughs> OTT, accessing tax credits and the CMF, before we go there and get everybody involved in that debate, Fran, we've talked for a long time about what I always say is we've been very deficient in this country, similar to what you said, Jocelyn, in positioning our success, who we are, both for our own country, our own citizens, and the world. That is changing. It's getting better. Telefilm and the CMF have done a lot of work together around the promotion and accessibility of content everywhere. Thoughts on all of that development, where we are today. Did it work? Did it not work? What do we need to do to make it better in the future? That's a really big question. Um, uh, I feel like we're at the beginning stage, in all honesty. And feature, in, you know, independent Canadian feature film is so much further behind television right now. I think uh, Canadian television really uh, is now being seen by Canadians and by the world as being um, an, um, an incredible contributor to the global excellent content marketplace. Canadian independent feature film, outside of a few, yes, this year we had two films nominated for uh, Oscars. Boy, that goes a long way in terms of Canadians finally seeing what is Canadian. Jocelyn and I had lunch together, and you can talk about room and people will say, oh, that's a Canadian-Irish co-production. That's because Canadian and non-Canadian um, media were driving that home, and it was a big part of what the producers did, what we did whenever we talked about it. We wanted to make sure that people understood that that was a Canadian uh, film. And my mission, I guess, at Telefilm is uh, twofold. One, how do we take uh, existing uh, feature films and keep pushing the, the boundaries so that people can be able to see them? So how do I make them discoverable? Well, under my banner, I finance all of the film festivals across Canada, and I finance initiatives to help to kind of you know, leverage all of that. So National Canadian Film Day. How can we take one day, have 350 screenings of Canadian film, and how can we take that one moment so that people go, oh, that's a Canadian film. Oh, I'm excited. I want to be part of that community. So that's part of how I'm doing it. The other side, though, and this is the more difficult side, is continuing in the development. How do we actually educate 
the, the filmmakers to understand what their role is. And if I go uh, this morning, there, there was a, a panel and we kind of talk about music, they now have to have a brand. Uh, and when I talk to filmmakers and I say, so what's your brand? What are the assets you're gonna have? It's like I'm insulting them. And so uh, I have to be very careful how I talk about it. But frankly, if you're making a feature film right now, right at the moment of conception, you have to start thinking not just about it being a feature film, but what platforms are you gonna put it on? Who's in your film? Who's writing your film? Does the director have a profile? Does the actor have a profile? Have they done television? What are the other things that I can use to help push this film and make it resonate? Who's the audience? Who am I writing it for? None of them do that. And that's for me, like as someone who's trying to be a promoter, and maybe you can talk to this, that's for me a huge challenge because right. they just want... Well, they want they to want, go to the next they film. They just want, yeah. So Lily Singh's a brand. Are there things that we can learn from, I mean, I just it's sto so still divided. You talk about the traditional model and how we need to make sure we have enough money in the system to do this incredible content, because I would agree with you, Canada has finally started to make its mark. You've got a system where you're taking some of this content to numerous places on behalf of producers, not this content necessarily, but different new creators. Will you bring this content? If I bring you Canadian feature films, will you put it on Rumble? <laughs> I mean, that's Absolutely. the question. Are the things that, where can the cross-fertilization cross start to happen? Because, you know, I remember five years ago when Minister Moore announced the CMF and the hue and cry across the country about the ridiculous notion of content anywhere, anyplace, anytime. And it turned out to be very prescient thinking about how the consumer market is going to access content. And so that big divide kind of shifted. Now we're in a slightly different place. So what can we learn from each other? What are your thoughts on how to kind of, I guess I'll ask you, taking what, we've, what our success stories are into that other world, or is, does that make sense even? Yes, yeah, so I, I think you gotta step back and make the distinction that there's a big difference between feature films that have huge production budgets and the social video who are able to, people are able to literally just sit there in front of their camera on their computer and get generate these massive audiences So w without any budget. So yes, I, I do believe there is a convergence happening between the feature films and the social video. But the problem with the social video right now and, and video online in general is the way it's monetized. So you're, if you're on YouTube, you're not making much money for the audience that you're generating. It it's really doesn't make any economic sense for a feature film to be sitting on YouTube unless you generate a massive audience. And even then, you're, you're, you're stepping back and saying, wow, if I had this on a different platform with a, you know, a different monetization structure, I would have I made a lot more. And then you had the Netflixes and the Show Me's and uh, the Craves and all, all these guys kind of come into the industry and offer something that was a better way to monetize digitally um, through subscription models. Uh, I believe that's helped bring a little bit more convergence into the, into the market, but uh, we're still not there in terms of you know, social video and feature films. And I believe we will get there and we'll all kind of see it all together as we get more, as we get smarter about where we're placing our content and who's watching that content, and then bringing in the brands to associate it, because an advertising model, I think it will work. I think it will prevail. Right now, it's not there. It, it prevails on television. It, it's just not digitally there yet. But I believe that will happen, and that will be able to, you know, translate digitally for the feature films where they or television, and they'll be able to monetize online. We just got to get a lot smarter f with on in how we monetize and bring the brands in appropriately. Jocelyn? Or? Yeah, well, I was just going to say the way it's best used now, sort of for between film and <laughs> your, your content, is television. And I say right now it's being used as more of a marketing and promotional tool. So you use social, whether it's video, whether it's people tweeting, whether it's, whether it's to help promote and get the word out there, because of course, that's where a lot of people are. That's where our audiences are. It's fan. It's fan based, and so you 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 um, uh, certainly from day one now, probably because of how you've brought that in, Val, of uh, the DM component, and 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 everyone has kind of started very early having a social and a, a digital media or nonlinear uh, 
a plan from day one to, at development, and then as you're going into production, you're you're shooting webisodes or you're shooting little behind the scenes, and you're you know we just did a, a theme song, we just did a music video for it, you know all that kind of stuff will all go up uh, into different on different platforms as as an, as a tool to promote getting back to the show because that's where we're monetizing. Right? So right now, that's how it is. It doesn't mean it won't be in the future, but right now it's a great promotional opportunity. And um, we only have, you know, one of the downfalls in this country compared to, I don't know how many of you were at the VR, at, uh, at uh, James's uh, VR thing yesterday, but I mean, isn't it amazing to see what Fox did with, <laughs> with that uh, promotional marketing campaign? I mean, I, like to have those kinds of dollars in this country would be amazing, but we don't. So we use every tool we can possibly have to just get people to find, so there's discoverability, to find our shows even on, the, on television. <laughs> you know? For, uh, Fran? I think it's um, also, and in, in, in Val, you've seen it, in terms of our production budgets, it's 3% or less in terms of the money that's going towards uh, marketing. Uh, and, and and that's problematic. It's really hard, in, even in terms of a $150,000 feature film. I can tell you, uh, with the micro-budget program, one of the things we did is we said that, uh, you know, 10% of your budget has to go to marketing, and then they come back and go, oh my God, but I need to put it on the screen. Like, I can't, I can't put it to marketing. So then we say, okay, guess what we're going to do? We're going to give you uh, Seven thousand more dollars to go out and find, you know, a digital strategist or a marketing strategist to help you, and and they're not equipped yet to understand where or how they can use it. And this is why I've kind of made it my mission to to start having them better understand how to use data, how to find your audience, to empower them. And it was a bit of when I got to uh, had the privilege to work at the CMF. That was a big part of you know when we started with the CMF making people not feel afraid of how you can find your audience and, and, and um, cultivate a fan base, and it's not a bad thing. And where I've really seen the success, funnily enough, we're with the, the, the people that were most afraid, which is documentary. I mean, documentary is one of the number one um, viewed uh, pieces of content on Netflix, and part of that is because millennials love to learn that way. And so how, if we're all going for the millennials, then how do we educate the content producers? And this is where I think, in fact, um, the, the people creating kind of that social content, it's a human truth. They're just out there showing something that is them. And so then how do I promote films or help people promote their films to show what their human truth is and help them find their audience? But that takes money. If I want to go and do, you know, have BuzzFeed kind of endorse me, that's 50 grand. Well, 50 grand's a lot of money if, if uh, you're, you're not even paying yourselves to be able to produce a film. So <clears throat> I think we have some major obstacles. Does it mean then I, you know, we double the budgets and we say half goes to your film, but, you know, you have to start, you know, we give them specific money that goes over and, and above. It's... And if you were here this morning, Facebook, Twitter, all of them, if you want any discoverability on there, you got to pay. There is very little organic reach now. So imagine that. Suddenly before, you actually had this ability to be able to sort of have a post and, uh, and it could potentially go viral. Now, boy, there's a lot of dark posting that goes on. There's so many other things that go on to help create that promotional infrastructure. Uh, and I frankly, I don't... I, I don't know how, you know, a 200000 or $300,000 film, that's a very small film for a very niche audience. I don't know how, like this, I'll, I would love to have you guys hack it at the end. But, you know, how do you find that, that market? How do you go in? And is it relying on the algorithms or the, the data or multiple platforms? Or as you say, Val, Let's just put it on every single platform that exists because I think somebody will discover it then if you have no choice but to find it everywhere. Well, I don't want to turn this into yeah. a feature film panel yeah. because it's one, you yeah. know, that, that's got its whole yeah. set of obstacles in this country in terms of how people are consuming yeah. content. Because as we all know, if you're an average Canadian and you want to go out and see a movie and you go to a theater, you're probably not going to pick a Canadian film. Why? Because you can't find it, because there's only 2% of the screens available for Canadian film content. And secondly, you're going to go to the rom-com or the kids' news kids movie or the action adventure, because it's going to cost you 150 bucks by the time you pay parking and the babysitter to have this experience. 
So picking a yeah. micro-budget Canadian feature film is not likely going to be your first choice. But we also know people are wanting that content and are watching it on TV. So I guess, I don't know, I don't know about you guys, I'm getting a bit confused. You say there is monetization possibilities. Yeah. You say it's very difficult to now get them there because all the big online platforms are going to charge. Jocelyn's point of view is that, but they are being used for driving back and marketing too. So again, in your experience, because you're dealing with some of those new content creators, how's the monetization of it working? Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it varies a lot depending okay. on the platform you're with. Obviously, Facebook at this point right now is, is a really good tool to get in front of an audience, but you're not going to make anything. Um, and that upsets a lot of creators, but they have no choice. So what we've seen in our experience is that you have to... You, you have to put it everywhere. Um, our, our strategy is that we, we embrace putting the content in as many places as possible, regardless if you can monetize it or not, because if you get that discoverability on Facebook, you will get you know audience on the other platforms looking for it, and then that's where you're going to monetize it. Yeah, you might miss out on the, a lot of viewers that watch it on Facebook, but you also need to put yourself in a position for the future when they do turn on monetization that you're there to capitalize on that. So I... I, I would really like, you know, our strategy is always to distribute it on as many platforms as possible. And depending on the platform that you go on, you know, it'll vary in how you monetize. With Rumble, obviously, we control how we monetize that. So the experience is we're trying to make it a lot better than anywhere else. And we're able to monetize at a metric of like 10x than you would on YouTube. So YouTube, you're traditionally looking at monetizing a video at about a cut, you know, dollar to two dollars after the entire fill rate. It's effectively a dollar to two dollars per thousand viewers. Um, but with uh, if you can bring that audience onto a different platform, let's say MSN or Rumble, you're able to monetize that audience at a much higher rate, upwards of 10 to 15. Now, that might not be the same as television and we might not be there yet, but five, six years ago, these social creators couldn't get that 10 to 15 on MSN. Now they have an ability to do that. Um, so it, the gap is closing. I don't know how long it'll take, but it seems to be rapidly closing at this point right now. And as these other platforms join the foray, like Facebook, and they are a lot smarter on monetizing, we might be able to see metrics 20 to $30. And then this gap just gets closer and closer and closer, where then all of a sudden production, high-quality content, if you can find the audience on these platforms, it might actually make sense. So I, I go ahead. No, go ahead. So yeah, I would really, um, you know, the way we see monetization happening, it really depends on where. It, it ranges from zero to, you know, 20 to 30. Um, but it's increasing and it's increasing every year. I think you need to position the film that you're making or if you're a creator, you have to be very agnostic of where you put it and you, you have to build for the future. I think that's the key and be in the right place in the right time, you know, two, three years from now, if you have that audience and you build it, you might not make anything today, but that's an investment three years down the road so with I these have platforms. A whole bunch of questions about <laughs> all access anywhere, rights and a bunch of other things. Jocelyn's gonna respond and then I just wanna check in with these guys and see what questions they have. Well, my only comment to that is that, again, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the industry comment in that we just wanna make sure that companies like yourselves, which is Canadian, that we, continue to figure out ways to ensure that the dollars that are being made are being put back into Canada and not into the hands of all foreign uh, con all foreign owners. And so you, rather than just the creator making money, that's fine. But right now with distribution companies like E1 or Tricon or, uh, you know, Nelvana or, uh, or um, you know, Temple Street, uh, Boat Rocker, um, for, for distribution companies, they are Canadian companies, so the revenue that they are making is being, is being put back into the system by um, investing in development, and, go, and, it, and it goes full circle. Right now, if it's a creator and it's, a, and it's all foreign country c companies making the money and the revenue is going in their hands, we're not putting it back into the system. So somehow, again, between now and the five years or now, we, we have to be smart enough to figure out how to make sure that s s that, that is somehow being put back into our own system so that Canada is propped up again. 
Okay. I was just, can I just, one, I was yep. just going to say, m I think my only, and we talked about this, our only concern, I uh, I guess, in general is if this generation that we now see um, don't want to pay for content, but they want really high quality content, then um, what do we look like as funding agencies uh, to, you know, does that mean, like, we finance 80% uh, of the feature films that are out there, you finance the majority of the Canadian television and digital media content that's out there. Uh, where will that gap come? I mean, I, I, we're still looking at, you know, digital dimes right now. I think it's growing, but, uh, you know, our television series costs a significant amount of money for one episode. So, I j you know, yes, we can get to monetization, but if we're going to move into this landscape of everything on every platform and maybe creating more for OTT, what does that funding structure look like? We don't have to answer it here, but it's one of the things that kind of preoccupies me. Well, the last time I was in a room and somebody said millennials don't want to pay, there were a bunch of millennials in the room who ripped the head off that person and said, that's ridiculous. Of course we will pay if we get what we want when we want it. So there's a whole bunch of assumptions in this. Okay, we're going to turn to you guys. There's a question here and a question here. Do we have a mic that we need to give them? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Oh, hang on. We can hear you. One second. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. There you go. There we go. Um, so... Can you uh, just introduce yourself? Sure. It'll just help us all. Sure thing. I'm Michelle McIver. I'm a digital media producer, and I work a lot with um, t linear producers on their interactive content. So one of the things that I'd love to throw into the discussion, right, Jocelyn, you mentioned the importance of having... Um, digital when you're looking at what your series is going to be or you having that top of mind. What are you guys seeing from the interactive side of things? So looking at games and game development with your kids series or the kind of stuff that Secret Location is doing with VR. Um, when you're selling these internationally, what kind of uh, value is being put on digital content? Well, uh, I can say from my broadcast days and, and production days that it's basically add-on. It's free. It's part of, it's, it's almost an expectation now. Oh, and so what digital assets do you have going with that as you're <laughs> selling your show, right? Um, it's an, it's, at the moment, it's not like you get some you know, huge amount of, of value. For, having said that, you, it's, it's an offer. It's what you're offering, trying to get your show seen out there and you're saying, but look, we have all of these things. Um, and again, luckily enough, in the Canadian system, we've had, we've got Bell Fund, we've got all these other funds that help us, and CMF Digital, uh, that help us get that made so that we can offer it to the world. Uh, you yeah, know. yeah, I find it interesting though because there's a lot more accountability on the digital media producers at mm -hmm. showing, okay, how how is this going to benefit the project? How are we going to make some money off of it? So if you have something in the App Store, you could be looking at um, potentially monetizing there, but it's just making sure that um, you know those who are doing this kind of producing is really making meeting the expectations, I guess you could say, from the funders who are helping support it. Um, you know, it's, yeah. it's a bit of a challenge, but... Yeah. Again, uh, it is a challenge, and and everyone has tried everything. We've tried, you know, uh, um, second screen games. We've tried, you know, everybody's tried a lot of things. So it's definitely still in an experimental stage. With some of it making a little bit of money, maybe here and there, but it's still promotion more than anything. So games is a great example with, on kids shows. Like some of those, I mean, it, some of those games are like the number one games um, on on uh, on the apps. And they're Canadian, and they've been made by fantastic producers like yourselves, and and they're they're top of the charts, be beating some of the uh, U.S. games that may maybe came up with those shows. Um, but it's 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 what it does is it helps promote kids to go back and watch the show, <laughs> and that's the honest truth. It's not like it's ge it's generating lots of views and lots of gameplay, but it's not necessarily generating money. It doesn't mean down the road. Get your answer. I have a whole bunch of views on the accountability of digital versus traditional TV, but that's a different panel. <laughs> you have another question. Hi, thank you. I'm Jen Centerton, owner of Mocha Media. So I help, um, I help companies tell their stories in interesting ways other than PSAs. But then a side project is on the social media platform and is sort of um, 
it's, it's been concerning over the course of the conference because I see this massive polarization between high-end production and, and the thing that has put Canada on the map over the years, and we don't want to lose that, of course. But then I find social media has been dismissed to cats and, and shameless self-promotion. And there is such a platform there. If you think of Business Insider and the videos that they're creating and the dialogue they're creating, and I feel like that's being completely overlooked right now in Canada. And I'm just curious, you know, especially to Chris, um, you know, can, can there be more substance online? Because that's what I'm producing right now. And, and I haven't heard that represented at all in any of the panels so far. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a huge component of our business. Actually, a lot of the creators that uh, we work with are in that social media space, uh, similar to, to uh, Business Insider making uh, videos that are very tailored to each social platform. Uh, for example, Little Things, which is probably, I think, the second largest uh, Facebook mm -hmm. publisher. Uh, one of them is a Canadian, by the way, but now in New York. Um, they, uh, they, they, they tailor every video they make, just like BuzzFeed, on Facebook to engage the audience in the best way possible. And they've created a, you know, a $50 million business out of that. Um, out of this little bit of, uh, of content and the video side, you know, they did start off on, you know, content like BuzzFeed that's very, you know, touchy and emotional and kind of really resonates with a specific audience, but it's now all coming into video and uh, it's not your, it, it's not your you know, vloggers uh, on YouTube, it's actual production produced content, whether it's, you know, a quick 30 second clip of how to make this or, uh, and that seems to be the trend, you know, two years ago it was cats and dogs, now it's uh, how, to, how to make uh, spaghetti really quickly. <laughs> so um, it changes all the time, but yeah, there's, there's a massive business opportunity there. I'm watching it, we, we are distributing that, and we're seeing which platforms that really works on, and there is production value in there, and they're high quality. They, the cost, though, is significantly lower than a feature film or television, and I think they're changing the game in a lot of ways because they're bringing down the costs in a dramatic way, yes. um, but able to monetize with an ROI now online. So th th this is a perfect example of how they're converging the two spaces, a uh, high quality output, short uh, for the time being, and engaging a massive audience that's very niche and very targeted. Well, in, in that sort of short format storytelling, that uh, there's still a production value, it can still look beautiful, it can be graphically driven, and Jocelyn, you sort of spoke to the point of the concern of not going to an internet, um, to that revenue stream not being reinvested. But as a lean and mean content producer who's churning this out and trying to feed an appetite of a daily, mm -hmm. um, a daily turnout for content for this voracious appetite in a niche market, you're turning that right back into content and it can be so cost effective as opposed to a major yeah. production, right? Absolutely, and, uh, and, and as I said at the very beginning, the ecosystem should include that and all the way to high end. Like it sh it, uh, no one should be saying it, it should be anything in between, but to not lose sight of um, the, the full scope of the ecosystem. Yeah. But is your point the connection between the high end traditional great TV feature film series and how to deepen that content experience in some of the digital online platforms so that what, at the end of the day, it drives more audience back to the original source? Was that your point no, or not? Sorry, I guess the question is, as we build forward, right. that, you know, I understand right now, yes, we capture an audience through social, for instance, and we drive them and we, and we create that community and we build a following for our, our higher end productions. But I would also argue, or, or I'm hoping, because that's what I'm building right now, is that there is a space for storytelling and a monetization that's, that's possible, whether that's through a bit of branded content, as um, Chris sort of alluded to there, you know, what is the architecture to build that? Um, because I think I think that should s be self-sustaining, and I think there is a model for that, but it's not really being explored. And then maybe if the funding can follow that to help reach a critical mass and get that following before the monetization and the high numbers happen. Th okay. th there is there is a model, and I, I don't think the that <laughs> world has utilized it the way they have. Like I, I watch feature <laughs> films that have huge audiences on Facebook, and I if you do employ that that strategy. 
yeah, that would be a, a massive opportunity to monetize and make significant revenue um, if you if you do that s the proper story storytelling on these channels. Um, on the social channels uh, and keep it very targeted. I, I completely agree with you. I, I think that's a, a huge opportunity for that industry to take advantage of. Do you feel, I mean, one of the things that I've been kind of musing with too is uh, I feel we're in a place now where when you have an idea, you can actually make a choice as to where you want to tell that idea. Are you going to tell it in short form online? Is it going to be a feature film? Is it going to be an app? Is it going to be a game? Is it going to be a television? Is it going to be all of them? And I think that's what I'm most excited about because you don't have to be one thing now. You don't have to say, I am a filmmaker and only be a filmmaker or I'm going to do, you know, television series. And uh, that's where I would love to sort of see this landscape move. Uh, and I think what, I'm ex what excites me about these platforms is there is really no barrier. And, you know, speaking f as a culture of bureaucrat, I think we have a lot of barriers in terms of, what you can do, what you can't do. You have to fit in a box. You have to do this. You have to do that. Uh, we're trying to lessen that a little bit. But, you know, to get a lot of these subsidies, there are a lot of things to do. You mentioned tax credits. Um, if it's a, you know, bigger feature film or some of the television series, you have to have a broadcaster. You have to have a distributor. There are certain... I don't think we're that hot in the room, are we? I didn't feel that hot. To Seriously? Seriously? <laughs> okay, let's find out what it is. I'll go find out. Thank you. <laughs> it's Netflix and Amazon <laughs> weighing in with their point of view, stopping everything. Okay, we're going to keep talking until we're told we're on fire, if you're okay with that. Gary? Hi, I'm, I'm Gary Mavara. Uh, just an old grump in the back of the room. Um, <laughs> At least you're not asleep with that comfortable chair. I don't think it's going to help. I think it's coming out of this speaker. I like that we, she's locking us I in know. the room. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually being filmed. It's like one of those commercials where they're going to see how we react. Everybody OK? Can we hear Gary? Can, you, can we hear you? Try. I hope so. OK. On the subject of, of tax credits, awesome. and we've It's a false had... alarm. Everybody calm down. Yeah. It's a false alarm. We'll need to back right there. Perfect. OK, Gary, let's give it a shot. OK, I'm, I'm going to go up to the hotel later and have a little review of them on their <laughs> risk <laughs> management behaviors and processes. But that's another story. Um, probably as part of this policy review, and we've had a lot of discussion in various provincial and federal jurisdictions about funding and things like tax credits and that sort of thing. And Jocelyn, you raised the, the, uh, the issue of uh, expanding the ambit. And I guess I'll ask the question and make the point that in all of these, uh, these programs, there are a number of explicit elements that you have to meet. And there are also some implicit elements that one has to meet. And, and I'll call the, the implicit element is that there is some benefit that's being derived by the jurisdiction as a result of either this funding or this tax credit. So you brought up the issue of OTT, which just happens to uh, align with the deadline of May the 18th next week on CAVCO. And, and I put to you that maybe as we think about expanding to OTT, in the context of... God almighty. <laughs> in the context of status Thank and you. benefit, what about having the notion in, that you can expand the definition to include OTT, but it has to be a Canadian OTT? So, for example, two of the three names that you mentioned earlier. Who at this conference pulled the fire alarm is what we're going to find out after this. Okay, let's let, since you pointed your question, Gary, to Jocelyn, start, we'll start with your response. Okay, well, look, it's a good debate because I said early, earlier, powered by Canada and getting out to the world. So if we're in a global 
business. And let's say there's a show, I'm just playing it out, but there's a show who that literally is cr you know, fully Canadian in every respect that we currently now know what, what that is. In every respect it's Canadian, yet, and I'm gonna play this out, Netflix wants to, wants to commission it, it's a world, you know Netflix does worldwide, yet everything about that show is Canadian. Should we not allow it to be part of the system and be out there in Netflix worldwide, Canadian show, Canadian creator, Canadian director, Canadian actors, Canadian, I'm going through the process. W is that okay? It, would we not say, you know what? It's because it, the initial reason why tax credits were supposed to be attached to linear was because it needed to be proven that it was viable. It was a viable piece of content, and that was the initial re reason for that link, right? And now, what is it that makes something viable when we talk about all the platforms? So long as we're creating and and fostering Canadian-driven content, and we are powered by Canada, and we're proud to have it out there in the world. Why can't it be part of the system? That's just the debate. And I'm I not well, but I'll, I'll, I'll take the opposite position on that, as you would expect me to do, is that in any tax credit or funding situation, <laughs> there are two players, and they each derive a benefit. There is the platform derives a benefit, and the producer derives a benefit. And what's implicit in that is that there's also a contribution back, economically or otherwise. So what I'm, and I'm not focusing just on Netflix, but just the notion is that if there is no benefit, monitoring, status, contribution, just nothing. It's out there in the cloud. Does that really achieve the, the goal that governments are looking for in terms of, of the benefit? Okay, now we're getting into the minister's consultation, which also is not the topic of this. But, you know, to add to Gary's point, it's, I think, as Jocelyn mentioned, it's part of this upcoming debate. So we say we're producing this great content in Canada through our regulatory system, which is what has built it, what has given Canada its success globally and worldwide, and we are in the global market. So Netflix and the foreign OTTs are in the country. I think Amazon's coming down the road pretty quick here. So they're in the country. They are licensing. They are paying production budgets. We've seen examples of that. I think the first one was between where Rogers was the Canadian broadcaster, accessed the CMF envelope. May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? It's not a false alarm. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you speak will you get our attention. He's going to comment on an OTT. <laughs> Net Netflix came in heavily, heavily in the production budget. They worked out the distribution the windowing. Everybody okay now? You're feeling better that we're not locked in a basement room about to be torsed? <laughs> um, so they came in. Everybody worked it out. It's in season two. What does that mean to all of us? I mean, the, the frustration in the country is, as you rightly point out, Gary, we've had this fantastic system where a certain segment of our industry has been required to pay in. Another segment's coming in over the top and is not required to pay in. We all saw what happened on the tax of Netflix discussion. So what is the solution? I think it's a, it's a question before us all. It was at the CMPA, largely in debate. We've got great Canadian services now, but as we heard from David this morning, Show Me is exclusive to Canada. That's the only territory that that particular service um, serves for all kinds of reasons. So if we, my question is if, if we limit to the Canadian OTTs, which is, I mean, obviously my opinion, I, this is just my own opinion, it's nothing to do with the CMF, is the CMF funds should be able to trigger content that show me and Crave and our Canadian OTTs are actually doing, especially if they're original series. Why wouldn't we? They're our services, they're 10 out of 10, they're great content. If we want to drive audiences and build audiences, to me it's just kind of common sense, but you know, others have a different view. Foreign's a big issue and a big question and a big threat because they're not forced to pay. Maybe they'll be taxed, maybe they won't. But if they're not, what do we do about it? Can we do anything about it? Because I don't think they're going to leave. They like Canadian talent. They like Canadian content, as you mentioned. They take one of those shows and take it all over the world. And if it's driven by Canada and it's Canadian, where's the benefit coming back if that series happened to sell everywhere? These are questions I think nobody has the precise answer to, but clearly they're going to be part of the debate that the minister has announced. Do you guys want to comment on that? I, 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 mean, I would just say that 
Can we, Pam get a mic here? Yep. I was just to say that you know the, the notion of the tax is very uh, poorly understood. So when it first came up, it was about contribution, but there are other forms of tax that others pay that they don't. So they don't pay into the general tax system in this country, i.e. Netflix. So at the very least, I think if you're going to benefit from a tax credit system, you need to be paying taxes like other other companies do, like show me, mm -hmm. we have to charge with show me I'm at Rogers, we have yeah. to charge an HST to every customer who gets show me, but if you get Netflix, you don't pay HST. So I think these fundamental issues, I mean, forget about contribution. Let's just deal with that like first. table stakes yeah. first. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we had a really interesting presentation from Quebec or a couple of weeks ago in Montreal, and Pierre Dion provided it to the Quebec production industry. And part of the stats, and Serge, correct me if I'm wrong, Netflix occupies 38% of the broadband in Canada now. The broadband width, so when are we going to run out of that and who's going to benefit? And uh, 40 million a month, I think, they take out of the country, was it? I can't just remember the exact number, but a lot. Comment, question. 445 million. 445 million a month? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, annually. annually. Okay, so that's divide that by 12, rough, yeah, okay, yeah. in we're, subscription. We're right. Sorry, I should have been Okay, right. no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not usually right, yeah. and I'm always glad to be challenged. What I think, I, I just heard the number somewhere. I can't remember if it was that presentation or not. So those are really big questions, but I think your point, Gary, is it does come back to the monetization question ultimately. is. Is there a way, in addition to GST, PST, HST, that those services can be used to help monetize Canadian content or not? I mean, that's really, I think, at the heart of the debate. Well, it's like getting it out there. Yeah. Because Get we're going to have a hard, it's just a competitive business right now. And the more handcuffs we give ourselves, the more it's just, just adding extra layers of barriers for us to get it out there. And I'm going to go to your point. And whereas over in your world, those barriers don't even exist. Right. You can pretty much put anything up. You know, so somewhere we've got to find a happy medium where um, we're just continuing to build what we've already built for 30 years and getting new and, uh, you know, all, all streams of e the ecosystem out there to the world and, so, uh, and not, you know, you just look at what happened to Nova Scotia when, when their tax credits were, they, that, it decimated that province. Well, and Alberta yeah. 10 years and ago, Alberta, which yeah. is now has a renaissance, and Saskatchewan, and it happened overnight. Else. It Boom. Happened overnight. Everyone left. Um, just before you go there, Chris, like back to Fran's question, I think the issue of structure and financing from government, and in our case, government and the BDUs, you know, we've talked for a long time about more flexibility. That's happening a bit now for sure. And I guess, you know, I don't see how we can keep pace with what's happening in this country and around the world on supporting content unless we have a lot more flexibility with, of course, make sure, making sure we mitigate the risks. Because I think the extreme control over quasi-government or government money came a lot from a couple of things that happened in the country. And I think now maybe there's a different way to look at risk and assess all of that so we can have a bit more flexibility. That's certainly what we've been hoping for and, and working hard with our government uh, partners, our government uh, funders to try to figure that out. You were going to comment. Y yeah, I actually had a question. Um, being on our side of the world and not really too much foraying into the, into the long-form content, but f from our experience, when we... When we distribute a video, um, and we distribute it everywhere, rather some some clients actually like to have it distributed, you know, in isolated environments, not everywhere. But for the most part, ninety percent of our clients, creators are they want it everywhere. Um, we we see a net effect that is far greater by distributing it ev everywhere in terms of revenue, um, regardless if it goes onto a platform that can't monetize or not. Uh, my question is then, if you were to do that with a film, and you were to you know, break down that barriers. Um, why wouldn't the net effect on uh, on the other platforms? Like, you might get all this viewership happen on YouTube on that video, but wouldn't that rise the tide on all these other platforms and drive viewership there too? Uh, have you guys tested that? Uh, I think that's what we're now trying to encourage the testing of. Uh, I, uh, part of it, I go back to education. A lot of the filmmakers <coughs> just actually don't understand the landscape that's out there. They don't know that there are companies like Juice, Dot Studio. There are actually companies out there that can help you do exactly that and put you in all these different platforms. 
uh, subscription or, or free that allow you to start being discovered. And one of the things I liked about Dot Studio in Vancouver, not only do they aggregate you, but they also take a look at what your content is and then they niche uh, push you to tastemakers, in particular with kind of LGBTQ. They have found tastemakers in very targeted places like Florida who actually consume more Canadian content than other people because Canadian, like the one thing I love about Canada, boy, do we create amazing content and people see Canadian content as having um, less restrictions. We talk about things differently than anyone else in the world. And, uh, and I think we have to, ca to your point, we got to capitalize on that. So what I'm trying, uh, most filmmakers, and this is very filmmaker, they just want to see it here on the big screen, and, and that's it. And they, they don't know how to get past it, which is why what we try and do is try and get filmmakers in this room so that they can say, oh my God, there are all these different places that I can, you know, instead of showing it to 300 people across Canada, how do I say, yes, you can have your screening, but boy, if you put it up on multiple platforms all around the world, not just in Canada, you can't, because I think you can. I really do think you can monetize it. You just have to do the work to, to get it there. So how does that work with issues like, and, and David again from Show Me mentioned this morning the concept of when Empire, which is the catch up on Show Me, is broadcast across the border at Fox, it drives people back and the, whatever that expression is, all boats rise, rising yeah. tide lifts all boats. But it must be only driving it back to show me because that's an exclusive service. So when you're talking about this broad, it should be content every, everywhere to be discoverable, how does that marry with the exclusivity of some services? And then, of course, the rights issue and the windowing and all of that. Do you have any comment on yeah, that? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a huge issue. So we've been talking to lots of different studios uh, south of the border, and uh, that's the, the whole DRM aspect is the, is the biggest issue. Um, what, like, you can't really rise the tide when you have all these restrictions on a piece of content. So you kind of need to go to the exclusive holder, but if they go and sell it to a different distributor in a different country where that has to be blocked, it kind of ruins the effect because these platforms are open to the world right. and you can't really have any DRM control. And that was the whole principle of Rumble is to build a, a YouTube type platform with a DRM control. Um, so yeah, with these, with these discussions that we have with studios and long, just long form content in general is how to break down that barrier because they, they are looking at the idea of kind of putting it everywhere and maybe adapting this, you know, all the, as the tide rises, all boats rise. Um, but there are, there are some, there are some barriers if they, if they're, for especially for long form content on the DRM side. And I don't think anybody has quite solved that yet. But hey, if you guys have a feature film that uh, you have exclusive rights in all jurisdictions for, you should have a channel on Rumble and take it I'll, everywhere I'll in the world. I'll send them. And test it with us. I'll send them <laughs> your way. But I think the bigger your budget gets, more mm -hmm. restrictions happen. So the time you get to the kind of $2.5 million budget, then you have to have a distributor or you have to have market interest. And then suddenly life changes a little bit because you're, you need to have that cash investment to be able to, to um, trigger telefilm funds. So this is where we get into, you know, which came first, chicken and egg, what's better? Whereas the, the filmmakers, uh, and I would say actually some of even the original content people that can kind of keep their budget at a much lower level, they can control their IP and the, they're the ones that we can experiment Right. with or work with to experiment, you know, to, to create that exploration of what's possible without, frankly, pissing off the distributors, which is kind of what I seem to be doing now. <laughs> but Jocelyn? Well, I, I would just say that, again, with the higher budget, they're paying for exclusivity. Right. When you're buying it in all your country, you're ex paying for exclusivity for the control of your platform. So it doesn't mean they don't put it on other platforms, but it's their right. platforms. And again, and so sometimes people will put the pilot up online or put it up in various uh, social areas or something like that. It, again, driving back to yeah. the initial, because they've paid a lot of money for that exclusivity and the dollars that are driven by that are coming from that exclusivity because it's the only thing, only place you can get it for now. It doesn't mean a day later they can't get it somewhere else, but that's what's driving it. I mean, point, appointment television, as much as everybody wants to say it doesn't really exist, it, 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 it does for those larger monetization right. <laughs> dollars, right? It still does, um, believe it or not. Okay, your turn. Questions? Come on, we've only had, yes, Mike. Thank you, 
you, Valerie, everyone. I think underlying, um, it's Irene Berkowitz. I've just finished uh, a PhD dissertation which attempts to solve the puzzle of Canadian media for the online era without crushing the strengths that we, and this is, and what I want to just point out Can you out just is put that up on the screen yeah. so yeah. we can kind of all read it? I, have, uh, I will. I have a four-part <laughs> copy. Yes, yeah. I do. Yeah, I will. That's what I'm trying to do, get it out, because the PhD is so solo. But underlying this discussion is, of course, Lily Singh and that kind of profitability, um, there is a divide, because underlying uh, Francesca and Jocelyn's uh, comments are, what is the best use of public money in the online era? And, and it might require scraping down, which I had to do in, in, my, in my process, to arrive at my four-part process, was to, which is to come to what's called in Silicon Valley an MTP, which is a massive transformative purpose of our system and what we want to use the public money for in a global online media delivery system. And that might mean, you know, and speaking to something that Jocelyn was saying, well, you know, there are some systems that are going to a producer-triggered system, mm -hmm. and then it may not be involved with protecting uh, domestic distributors. I mean, you know, trans you know, going back across the line, Twitter's having a hard time being profitable with 350 million users. 36 million is just too small to profit profit from, you know, with a $2 million program. So um, before, I, I have a feeling in this digital consultation, we really need to start with what is the purpose of our system? Um, and just to say that, our last two really game-changing innovations were in 1971, which was simultaneous substitution, and that gave rise to the 30% profit, which was then transformed to a 30% spend for CPE. And our point system, which was built in 1984, uh, which took, and both those processes took four years to come up with, and they worked very well through the 20th century. So the urgency, don't you feel, is to come up with a top-down um, goal about what we want to achieve with our public money in a completely changed distribution, global distribution. I think it's all upside. We have, like I said this morning, 8 billion people we can entertain. So, yeah. Serge. Uh, <laughs> just want to comment on uh, what uh, you've just said on uh, the funding that should be focusing more on the production side than the distribution side. Two things about, about this first, the distributors uh, right now are funding the CMS. And second, if we lose control over distribution, the production side will suffer of it because if it's the American platforms that take all the market, we may have a big problem of discoverability of Canadian content because the priorities in the states about what is being marketed uh, are not the same priorities as Canadian platforms have. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm sorry, I forgot your name already. Thanks, Jen. Sorry. Um, sort of as a further to Serge's point of just sort of, there's a yeah, yes, there'd be a concern of um, of losing ourselves to a broader market, but then again, the power with a lot of the targeted advertising that you can do to reach an audience can be so specific that you're, you're cultivating these niche audiences and if we can serve them in a more editorial way, then it's so powerful. Um, my question to Chris on that was, how, how do you um, harvest that audience and nurture that community? You know, is there a way to capture that through lead pages and then you, know, you have an email subscription base, for instance, and then exclusive content comes to that community that you've, um, that you've captured? I'm just curious how you do it at Rumble of how you harvest that audience. Yeah, um, it's, it's a lot different than that in terms of how we, we gain traction. Um, we're doing, you know, north of 250 million viewers a month now, which is, like I said, a lot larger than, than Amazon and BuzzFeed. But um, that's just on, on Rumble, through Rumble and Rumble content. And that's Canadian-owned, by the way, so that's a big plus. <laughs> um, but the, the way we were able to, to grab the market share was through putting a layer of DRM on top of the all, all the content. So typically, when content goes onto YouTube, there's it, it goes into this 
closed platform where then another licensor comes in on top of it and represents that creator. So Lily Singh probably has an MCN that's sitting on top of, of her content and representing it. And then you have YouTube. So there's, there's actually a few layers involved in, in the process um, for these YouTube stars. Whereas with Rumble, we wanted to cut out that layer of, of MCN and rights management and put that onto the platform itself. And by doing that, we were able to eliminate the barriers and allow publishers, um, whether it's Little Things, who's a huge partner of us, or BuzzFeed, or whoever it may be, uh, to monetize this content. Because typically, when, when a BuzzFeed or a Little Things takes a YouTube video and they want to distribute it, they don't get to make anything off this content. Um, so what we did with our, with our DRM layer on top of it is that we're allowed to bring in the publisher to monetize the content as well. So now Little Things and BuzzFeed can participate in the monetization. And because of the DRM layer, we're allowed to charge advertisers 10 to 15 X more than YouTube can because now it's like all editorially controlled content and we know what's on there. So w not only is the, is the creator able to make more because we get that 10 to 15 X, but now the publisher jumps in on the game and that's how we were able to get that distribution and uh, you know, have such crazy growth in the last six months in terms of audience. That's really different from what you've talked about in terms of when you're creating content for traditional television, it's all about ad revenue and whether you're gonna actually be able to maintain the ad revenue needed to keep the, the show financed versus, you know, in terms of going socially, you create the content and then if you get enough hits, the ad revenue is going to come in, so it's it's very different. One is kind of if 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 you can be right and get in there and find your your audience, the advertisers want to be part of you know what you're doing. But it's I mean, do you find in terms uh, of television, it, it's well, a, it is the same thing though. It's just different layers <laughs> in that you have to find your audience and you have to gain the ratings. Um, it, ratings is a whole other panel that we could talk about, but um, um, you have to still get your audience in order to monetize it so, so that your broadcaster or your platform is, is making money so that they will then continue the series into a second season, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? There was a comment at NIP, and I, I just brought it with me because I wasn't sure if we'd go there, but it's an research, international research firm called uh, OOYALA, -O -A -A -A, I guess, and he said, the challenge for both digital networks and legacy TV companies is how to enable viewers to discover what they want to watch amongst the thousands and thousands of online channels. How can they tell the wheat from the chaff? This is where the broadcaster's deep pockets, I think our broadcasters here might argue that point, but the broadcaster's deep pockets can help the quality of, in this case, MCN's content and grow their audience. So to me, that spoke a bit to this upcoming relationship as it shifts and emerge and how we try to bring the best of both of those worlds together to reach a more international and global audience because that's always really been the challenge. I mean, our Canadian system started from a policy perspective, I mean, from the, at least our mandate was content for Canadians. And yet, you know, we can't afford, I guess, any longer to stand on the 49th parallel and look up. It is a global business. If we're going to have our content survive, it has to be everywhere around the world. So that language is now on the direct website. Right. I haven't looked on that in a while. Okay, we just have a couple more minutes left. Other, Gary, did you have something you wanted to add? No, you're good? Okay. Someone else? Yeah. Um, I just have a, uh, oh, sorry, I'm Megan Bingley. I'm with a really small radio station here in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And I have a cool website. Um, What's the radio uh, station? Indy 88. Woo! Oh. Woo! Woo! What are you talking about? Small, you started with Rick Astley. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Two years old, so still pretty <laughs> small, but thank you. Um, so um, I'm I'm not as in touch with video as all of you are, but I just have a question about how do you really measure your success now? Like we're talking a lot about monetization, and um, you know, it's uh, there's there's it used to all be about uh, the, the the scale. Um, but you know, there's a lot of niche productions and and other things like that, and you're also competing, obviously, with uh, some people who are just you know kind of doing it for fun um, and somehow kind of stumbling upon success mm -hmm. and they're turning it into a business rather than starting as a business to begin with. Um, so my question is, how how have you had to to change measuring success? Like, how do you even value your content? Um, because it's everything from you know just trying to recover the cost of the production, some content that just has you know some societal value, maybe not a lot of 
um, very, very niche or very small? Um, are you still trying to estimate audiences? Um, Excellent question. Yeah. Excellent question. Yay for <laughs> the radio guy. Uh, I'll jump in. Okay. For, for us, it's really simple. Um, it's audience, uh, how much audience we can get our content in front of. Uh, we don't really look at the, the revenue side of things quite yet. Uh, revenue seems to always catch up. And in two and a half years of business with Rumble, uh, we're, we're, like that does happen. Like Revenue always catches up. And uh, Facebook's another prime example. All we're, all we're going for right now is an audience. Obviously, engagement's important. But uh, revenue will catch up there, too. So our success is measured strictly by audience. Jonathan? I would say, OK, so the advent of subscription-driven um, providers has changed a lot of that in that it used to always be ratings, OK? Now, with subscribers, there's critical, you know, cr HBO will say it's, it, you know, it's really critical acclaim. It's, it, you know, they will, a lot of them is really about that. I'm sure there's a data management aspect of it, certainly on the Netflixes and all the OTTs. They're looking at all that data and what are people watching for how long, all that kind of stuff, different kind of data than ratings. Um, so it's, it's a myriad of things. And then, you know, something might not be at, uh, Game of Thrones, but if it sells in 180 countries around the world, God bless, like people want to watch. And not everybody has the same level of what they think is great quality and what they think is fun to watch and what they kind of get a little bit of a vice from watching, you know. Um, Bachelor's a perfect example of that. Like, it's not exactly the highest quality show, but people have, it's a vice. It's, a, it's a, something that they love to watch. It's fun, it's entertainment. Um, so there's, a whole array of things that make something successful, um, and you know, awards is another thing that people will hold up. Just you know, it may it may have gotten hardly any ratings, but if it, it got if it won, you know, twelve Emmys, people will pay attention. It's all of a sudden popular, and it's all of a sudden going to get you. So th there's a whole array of things that make something successful, but certainly the subscription side of things has changed what risk people will take because yeah. it isn't about ratings. And it's changed um, what we consider to be quality and what we consider to be um, a success. Go ahead. And I'll ju so I'll just say very quickly, Telefilm Canada actually has constructed a success index. So I saw you at the opening. I think you were at the opening of Sleeping Giant, or at least Indie 88 was part of the opening of Sleeping Giant. So a film like that will go through a success index, and it's evaluated on cultural, commercial, and industrial. Um, and that allows us then to kind of put... Um, Benchmarks. Originally, everything was just measured on box office. And uh, as you all know, you've heard me, it's not the best way to evaluate uh, independent Canadian feature film, in particular when a sleeping giant would be up against a Star Wars in terms of how we had to measure it. So that's why we, we've really changed the, the way we evaluate it so that when a, when a film wins an award somewhere internationally, it actually can um, elevate it in the score and it may not do as well at home. So that's a big, I, I can, uh, you know, Adam McGoyan's Captive did not do very well here, but internationally, mm -hmm. the sales were really, really strong. The CMF, it's all been audience driven primarily, although increasingly there's discussion about international recognition awards, especially in the doc sector, and certainly sales, which is something we're just trying to pull the teeth out of production companies to get some basic stats and see how that is growing, because we know it is, we see it, we hear it anecdotally, but we haven't really captured it. There's another question here, and we're almost out of time. If anybody's got anything else, please introduce yes, yourself and go ahead. Yes, yeah, sure. My name is Solange Drouin. I represent the independent record producers in Quebec, so I'm in the music industry. Um, is there, in the music industry in Quebec, we used to have good local success. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still it's becoming difficult, more and more difficult just to to just have a local success, but all the artists are not exportable, you know, even if we want to. And you, you're still talking about the global market, the global market, but is there any place for a good local success anymore? Well, I think that's an excellent point, and we envy the success of Quebec, all of us, <laughs> all the time, <laughs> everywhere, not just in music, but in content, generally speaking, because it's such a unique, diverse market, and. We've often looked at even the success in terms of back catalog content, the work Elephant has done in the province. But the recent discussion, even at the Netflixes of the world, on this issue of local content and how 
the whole world is looking for local content. So do you want to comment on that, the three of you, Jocelyn? Uh, there's Jessica? some huge, like this hour is 22 minutes yeah. and, and some, you know, so political satire that's very specific to Canada or to our world. I mean, those shows of, I mean, how many seasons now? Like, <laughs> you know, so absolutely that still exists. It's just, as you said, very competitive. And so um, that has, that's a show that's very local has to be covered with tax credits, almost 100% by a Canadian player. Whereas um, uh, something that would have a global appeal, uh, someone can pay a little less for it and then we sell it all around the world and that helps pay for. So it's just a different, but it doesn't mean it doesn't still exist, absolutely. And there are some shows that do really well here and, and don't do that well uh, in other countries for some reason. They might have sold there, but they don't do that well, you know? If, if I just quickly put on my feature film hat, though, one of the things I can say, I was at the Canadian Screen Awards and I was uh, working the red carpet and Felix Inera and some of the other um, productions came through and one of the things they talked about was penetrating the English market. Uh, they felt that most of their films were not actually being seen outside of Quebec. And so there was an interesting conversation to have, even in terms of the rest of Canada mm -hmm. being able to see. I mean, we're very fortunate with my internship in Canada. It kind of, you know, uh, went around Canada, mommy. But in terms of some of those smaller independent films, it's the same thing. They're actually seen more in France than they are anywhere else in Canada. So it is a conversation we need to have because I do think people like local. There are Canadians uh, that want to see local. It then goes to our bigger conversation of how do they penetrate the, the marketplace and where do they find their, I mean, ultimately, where do you find the audience? Good. Any comment? Well, I mean, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so for us, it's a little bit different. Um, er, we don't really do anything on the, on the local level, but we, we definitely, uh, when we do distribute, we, we try to be as targeted as possible. And a lot of it's a lot of stuff is, is French and Spanish. Um, we do support uh, a lot of that. Um, and when we distribute it, we, we try to keep it as targeted as possible. So for an example, there's a lot, there's actually a lot of huge sites with a lot of distribution out in France. Um, and that content does really well in it over there. But uh, for, it, I guess with technology and digitally, um, there's more of the ability to, to take things locally yeah. and monetize locally. And actually, the, the cool thing about that is that uh, that local digital distribution actually monetizes like almost five times more than the just hmm. general di distribution. So there, there is an opportunity there. I, I, I don't see too many people taking advantage of it digitally, but uh, there are a few. And they do really well, so it, it that exists on the on the digital side. Last question. Actually, it's not a question. I just wanted to confirm uh, something that you said about um, this hour has twenty two minutes and local content. I was reading recently that I guess um, this hour is twenty two minutes has been finding a lot of new audience by uh, putting a lot of things on social media because th they're finding a lot of younger <laughs> millennial audiences and. Um, probably able to maybe drive that through to YouTube and monetize and finding new uh, new yeah. revenues that way. So I think, you know, Colbert and, and, and well, that group has probably opened up the doors for that type of yeah. thing to yeah. be watched. Yeah, it was always funny because they had the reruns uh, a lot on TV and it would be kind of behind the times. But if you do look at it kind of as a Colbert and I think millennial uh, political interests, um, there's probably a huge opportunity for these kind of things that are local and feel really Canadian. And they're editing, you know, like many of them, like SNL and everything else, they're editing to sort of the little clips that then drive you to the longer form yeah. content. I mean, and I think the other, in terms of local, uh, I'd be remiss in not mentioning like the Trailer Park Boys. I mean, talk about something that is extremely <laughs> local. Uh, it's less Canadian now that it's gone on to Netflix. Uh, they've actually talked about how they're trying to make it less Canadian than it was, um, because that's what the market, they're kind of want to move past that. But uh, It's local, though, in any place that has a trailer park. Well, it's very true. Nova Scotia. <laughs> I mean, all over Florida. <laughs> okay, we're done. I don't think we answered, the, did we answer the question about monetization? Probably not, but I think three comments. Um, Clearly, open access and a new distribution system is a way to increase discoverability for sure. Producers, especially I think feature film, it relates to new, need to find new platforms, bring content to market beyond the world we know. And the current system really needs to respond to discoverability, but ensuring we don't neglect the essence of how we get that quality program to take it to an audience in the first place. 
Anything else from the three of you? Anybody else? Last comment? We're done. We didn't burn down. Yay. Thank you, Val.